I'll be your MC for the night. A few housekeeping issues. If you want the restroom, um, the ladies are on the same floor. You use that door right over there. And the gentlemen are downstairs. Yep. Okay, do we have any folks from MTC? Okay, any folks from Standard Bank? Okay. Uh, we'll just like to say thank you to MTC for sponsoring the event as well as uh, Standard Bank, as well as uh, Caribou Flowers. Um, thank you very much to all our sponsors. And um, if you came with somebody and you're sitting next to them, please stand up and introduce yourself to somebody else you didn't come with or you do not know. Tell them your name, what you do, and maybe the phone number if it's, you know, that kind of vibe. Yeah? Could it, you know, give yourself a round of applause for being here, you know you? You could have been, you could have, you could have been anywhere else, but you decided to be here. I, I chose the wrong way school. Uh, because now you can see my kapunda. In Swapo they call it the patriotic front. <laughs> you know? No, thank you for being here. Uh, I, I was, when I was preparing the show, I was telling somebody, man, I'm going to do a show. And he said to me, how much are you going to charge per show? And I was like, about 250. No, I first started with 500. 500. And he was like, what? See, you're 500. He said, hey, bro, ah, calm down a bit. And I said, okay, let's make it 450. He said, ah, whew. I'm like, okay, 400. He's like, I bra, you know, it's harambe, man. And I'm okay, let's make it like, 250. They say, yeah, that's okay. And then the next thing he asked me, so, any complimentary ticket? <laughs> now, I actually realized that a lot of us, the state of the economy has become almost like a running joke, isn't it? Everybody's talking about the economy. Everybody's talking about, ooh, you know, people are even breaking up because of the economy. <laughs> you know, people are, yeah, people are breaking up. Like, why are you leaving the economy? What about the economy? Well, it's the economy, <laughs> you know, and uh, we, we actually, you know, even on social media, when, when people are posting things, they are even starting to make fun of their own status, their own financial status. You know, they're like, I'm posting, oh, I'm just here eating my brown bread with bologna, you know. Before this, I used to eat like Kentucky Fried Chicken. And I actually realized that if we're not careful, that's going to become our reality. You see, the more you say something and you repeat it to yourself, the more it becomes your reality. You know, uh, you know that uh, every time your parents tell you, don't repeat that thing, don't say that, they were trying to tell us, be careful of what you say. And, and somebody said to me, Lazarus, you know, somebody like yourself, you are involved in business. You guys are probably not feeling the economy. I said, well, we are feeling the economy. All of us, because without people, I don't have a business. So when you say to me, Lazarus, the economy is not really affecting you, what are you talking about? I need to sell to people. And if I don't have any people to sell to, what's going to happen? So what, here's the problem. Because of the state of our economy, what, is, what, what, what are we doing now? We are afraid now. 
fear has captured us. Eh? We are all afraid. Uh, you have $200 to spend. You're looking at your $200 and you say to yourself, Phew, okay, do I spend the $150 or do I spend the whole $200? Somebody else just man, where you end, man. Just spend the two hundred dollars. Why are you, you know, why are you afraid to spend the money? Now, I've, I read a very interesting book the other day, and they said uh, during the Great Depression in 1933, and also the, finan- the global financial crisis in 2008, there were people who were making money, and I was like, how? And these people had one common trait. They were all trying to take advantage of what was happening. When other people were fearful of taking risks, they were taking those risks. So by the time the economy recovered, they were make, making more money than everybody else. You know? So here's the thing. I, I, I want to start with the depressing stuff and we're going to end with the fun stuff later. Né? So I mean, here's the thing. So we can all start here and talk about the economy, the economy, the economy. And let me just tell you something. If you are broke in this economy, it's your fault. Mm-hmm. Okay. If you are broke in this economy, whose fault is it? Who spent your money? Who failed to plan? I'm so happy you are saying that. Somebody say it's the government. I'm so happy somebody said that because here's the problem. The problem in our country is we have surrendered our sovereignty to the government. You have surrendered your individual, your individuality to the government. Here's the thing. The government is like that big brother out there. We don't care what's going to happen. Ah, the government will make a plan, isn't it? Well, the government is not making any plan now. You are on your own. Because the minute we start depending on government for everything, when are we going to become creative? When are we going to start thinking out of the box? Somebody said to me the other day, Lazarus, I'm actually happy the country is broke. And I was like, what? Yeah, I'm happy you broke because you, you, you guys were tenders. I'm so happy. I'm happy. I'm happy there are no more tenders. And I was like, why? Now... The playing field is level. And I said, okay, how is the playing field going to get level? And he said to me, we need to start thinking out of the box. So here's a couple of things that I've learned about thinking out of the box. So you're probably sitting here, sitting there looking at you thinking, oh, Lazarus probably has a lot of plans. eh? He knows how he's going to make money out of this economy. And Lazarus probably has got some tenders lined up because he was connected and stuff like that. No. Here's the good news. The good news, I'm going to share with you what I think we all should be doing collectively. Collectively to get out of this. Here's the first thing. You need to have the mindset that nobody owes you anything. Right? I remember when I, when I, when I left, when I finished high school, I was trying to study. I wanted to become a filmmaker. It was like 1988, 89, white people thought black men trying to be a filmmaker. Are you serious? I went, I went to tell my father, Dad, I want to become a filmmaker. He didn't even know what a filmmaker was. He's like, what happened to be good jobs like being a preacher or a teacher? And, but I left my parental home. I came to Vendu. I think I had like 50 bucks in my pocket. And for the first time in my life, because I went to school in Swakopmund, and when I was in Swakopmund, we used to go to town. We just walked to town. For the first time, I got to Venduk. I realized how far Katutura is from town. And there were these things called taxes that you need to pay. So I had like 50 bucks. And I think back then, the taxi was like $4.50 or $2.50 or whatever. So I actually calculated. That was, that was, a long, that was, that was long ago, right? Was it before you were born? <laughs> huh? Just like, just after you were born, right around there. Are you one of those women who don't tell people how old you are? How old are you? Only. <laughs> okay. Now, let me tell you. In, in, so, when I came to Vendu in, in 1989, right, I got a job for the Department of Water Affairs. Back then, it was Department of Water Relation. My job, I was working in the personal office. My only job I had was I used to look, look after 
the Tates who could not speak Afrikaans or English, and I used to complete their application forms for leave. <laughs> Every day, from Monday to Friday, hello, Tate, what's your name? Johannes Paulus. What is your employee number? Two, three, five, four, six, seven. When do you want to go on leave? Ah, 20 days. From which day to this day? Sign that, sign, done. Every day, that was my job. For a whole year. Every day. I got so good at my job. I knew most of those people's names by heart and their employee numbers. So they used to just come and say, hi, how are you? And I said, when do you want to go on leave? <laughs> right? So that's what I started doing the job. I started doing the job so diligently, and I was, I was really excited about it. Man, last night, you need to do something about this. But there was this thing called taxi money. Now, I had this thing that I didn't have taxi money. Is this, is your, who's calling you? Oh, you had a date, and you stood him up. And the guy's like, it's it. Are you now? Tell him, I'll come after lessons. I mean, I'll come to you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and don't distract the people. <laughs> okay, so. And then there was this thing called taxi money. So what happened is in the morning, I did not have taxi money. Honestly, because I had like a choice between butter brechens, two butter brechens, uh, and oros. You know, oros? Or taxi money. And I was like, so I used to really join the Tates with the blue overalls. Every morning at 5.30, I'll be walking. I used to stay in Damara location. And I'll be walking from Damara location all the way to town. And I was so depressed. So when I, I went home, I think I, there was like a, a long weekend somewhere. Like Easter, I went home. I told my dad, no, dad, I can't do this. He said, what's wrong with you? It's like, no, I can't do this. First of all, I don't have enough money. I'm staying with people I don't even know. I was staying, sleeping in the living room on the floor with some people I don't even know because I, 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 anyway, I did not have accommodation and I don't have enough. My father's like, so, first of all, here where you stay, you're also sleeping in the living room on the floor. <laughs> so what's the problem? Okay? Secondly, you have a job. You see that old men, they're sitting, those people sitting there drinking tombo, they don't have jobs. So what are you complaining about? You are better off than those people who are sitting there drinking tombo. And I was like, aha, okay. So now go out there and do your job. So I decided, and these are the things I want to share with you. I decided, how am I going to make my life exciting when I'm going to do my job so that I'm looking forward to going to work every day? What am I going to do to make sure that if I have money, I'm going to make the most of the money that I have. You don't have to be a millionaire, but millionaires, billionaires, thousand years, they all have the same principle, right? We all have the same principle, isn't it? The very first principle I realize is you can't spend what you don't have, right? You can't spend what you don't have. So if you only have enough money for taxi from the first of the month to the 15th, that's what you have. Secondly, make alternatives from the 16th to the 30th of the month. That's what, that's, that's what I had to do, and I said, okay. Or find another way to have transport. So I went to this one guy, to two of my, three of my colleagues, and I said to them, guys, can't we pull something together so we can have transport? And the guy said, okay, cool. Who, do, who are you going to go to? There was a guy who was working on the second floor here in a party, and we said to him, bruh, Taxi money costs us 60 bucks a month, but can we give you 40 bucks a month, month and then you can, give, you can transport us, you can pick us up from somewhere. And the guy said, cool. And just like that, my taxi problem was resolved. Right? That has taught me one lesson. If you are operating outside fear, if you do not let fear take, take over control, you will be able to think clearly. Right? So one thing I want to share with you this evening is, don't operate from fear. Don't let what hap what's happening to the economy drive you to be so afraid that you are not able to think for yourself. Two, I started isolating myself from people who complain all the time. Or ev you find them every day. You will, there's always this person 
all they do, they just can't wait to complain. You know? And if you, if you actually realize right now what's happening in our economy, there are actually people who come to you and they want to get support for their misery. <laughs> Have you noticed that? Because it's almost like it's a drug. You know, people get addicted to misery. Yeah? So some, some people even get addicted to poverty. Like you can, you can take somebody out of poverty, put them in a place. If they are not ready, they'll be like, ah, no, bruh, it's okay. Um, keep ours bleak. Me, Okoriangava, um. Right? So, I started isolating myself from people who were complaining all the time. They will come to you, especially now with the corner people come to you and say, hey, last night, how's it going? No, cool, man. Ah, bruh, no, ah, it's over, man. What? Ah, the country is over. It's finished. No, how? Nothing is working. I'm like, you got a job. Yeah, but nothing is working. But what is wrong? But they can't tell you what is wrong. They want you to say, yes, things are over so they can say, aha, I'm not the only one. So, just like the other day, I was, <laughs> I was filling out my car and I was listening to these two gentlemen talking to each other, uh, these two petrol attendants. And even the petrol attendants are talking to you about GDP now. <laughs> <laughs> so, that has taught me that you can't just be complaining about the economy. Use this opportunity to learn about the economy. Because now you're sitting here, you might be sitting on a gold mine, and your ideas that you might have might take you out of this economy, but you do not understand how the economy works. It's only when people are going to become rich, you're like, yo, I could have done that. Yeah, but you are busy complaining about the economy, right? So isolate yourself from people who complain about that. Let me just tell you, how many of you are in, ooh, we are people who are coming late. Please, come on in. You know, for black people, this is still early. <laughs> I'm the opening act. Come in, the main guy will still come. <laughs> so, let me just, so here's the thing. At any given time, at any given work that you find yourself right now, how many of you are employees? Let me see that. Sure. How many of you are working for somebody? Okay, let me talk to you, employees with numbers. <laughs> Take you, let, me talk, let me tell you something. In any, any given time at your work, at your place of work, you have three types of people. Three types of people, three categories of people I want you to identify. One is I call brother project. <laughs> right? Brother project, you know him. Brother project is that brother who always has brown envelopes with a briefcase, you don't know what the hell is in that briefcase, but every time he's talking to you, he's working on a project. Bruh, I'm telling you, if this thing goes through, as clear, I'm leaving you as a, bruh, you guys, you'll be still here, me. I'll be like in my ML63, right? Brother project. Second week you see him, He's got another project, bra. This week is Fese, bra. <laughs> Working on fishing, fishing. Huh? Third week, you see him, construction. <laughs> right? This brother project, he's always. Now, then, then you can get a second person that I call Sister Maria. Sister Maria is the most lovely person that you can get. Sister Maria just comes in, the, she just wants to do her work. She comes in, if you start working at eight, ten to eight, she's there. She reads a newspaper, eight o'clock, she starts working. Sister Maria is working. We don't know anything about Sister Maria. We don't know who her husband is. We don't know how many kids she's got. Occasionally you'll hear saying, I'm, I can't be roughness too. But <laughs> we don't know why she that and Sister Maria's like is like, leave me alone. This I'm just here to work and go home. We're like, if there's a staff meeting, Sister Maria is sitting right at the back. She's like, sitting like this. And when the boss is speaking, she's like, mm, mm, mm. And if you are speaking, she goes, uh, you know. The third one, Ooh. the complainant. They suck your energy. Every time they come to you, who said, bra? No, it's fine. Ah, things are not okay in this company. What is not okay? No, just everything. Ah, what is the eye? 
When was the last time we had a salary raise? Last year, this time. Yeah, but how much was it? <laughs> we got 15%. Yeah, but other people, they got 25%. <laughs> That brother complaining will buy a car, drive his car, smash his car, come to the office and complain that his company actually caused him to smash his car. <laughs> right? Brother complaining is always complaining about stuff. I know this company is one. You know those three people in your company. So I've, I've realized when you have those three, those three types of people, Best to align yourself with the people that are feeding your energy. So this is what I've learned. For every person in your company that you work with, you all know about assets and liabilities. Compl compile two lists. On the left, assets. On the right, liabilities. The assets is Sister Maria. Liabilities, complaining. Spend more time on their assets than their liabilities. That's all you need to do. Second group of people, family. Family is the same thing. You find two or three different types of people in any family. The first one is United Nations. She just wants to solve everybody's problem in the family. Even if it's like three cousins removed, <laughs> and she hears there's a problem. It's a cousin. Did you hear what? Who? Oh, say Maria's daughter. Who's Jose Maria? My mother's grandmother's what? What? Yeah, but why? Why is it? But she's family. What is it? But it's her. Apparently, uh, who the husband? <laughs> she's like it's her daughter, the husband. What about the husband? Apparently, things are not okay. So what do you want us to do? It's a, let's okay. I think we need to follow call like a little family meeting and. <laughs> Why? And she's the first one to put, <laughs> she's the first one to form a family WhatsApp group. <laughs> Isn't it? And then you're sitting there looking at your phone and suddenly you just hear ding 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 ding. You've been added. <laughs> ding 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 ding. What is it? And then the, the names are always exotic. Family first. <laughs> one love family. She wants to solve, and eh, there's the second one, I, the jailbird. There's always a criminal in the family. <laughs> Every family, I was like between criminal and the third one I'm going to talk about. There's, like, there's always this guy who's always in trouble. You don't know how. It's just like, do they just attract? You, like, like I, okay, I have a cousin. This guy is always looking for somebody to stab with a knife. I'm not kidding you. It's just like it's just it's just like a drug for him. So who's a brand name? I'm an ignorant man. Let's go shut up. You know, and you you can identify him from the moment you were small. He's the one who was always breaking people's windows, or he's beating up somebody's kid and running. You know, and the third one, hey, the third one is most of Mr. Resources. Yeah, this is the one we always go to. And everybody assumes they have money. They don't know how much money you have. They don't know how much, how, how much debt you have. They always say, if there's a problem in the family, go to Johannes. <laughs> and I like the way people take your money and they budget. <laughs> no, they budget. They know Johannes is going to give the money. My salary is $2,000 a month. My expenses is $4,000, but Johannes will pay the other $2,000. Now, if you come to Johannes and say, Johannes, uh, I need the additional $2,000. And he's like, for what? No, no, you know, my school fee, child, there's always like school, children, fees, school trips and whatever, but I don't have money. And then they get disappointed. It's it. <laughs> and then they get angry. With, now, now what now? <laughs> what do you mean what? Now, what, what can I do now? I don't know, but I was depending on you now. How can you depend on me? It's not your money, right? So how do you survive this economy? Identify those people. Identify those people. And there are th those are some of people I call energy thieves. 
It doesn't matter what you do. Oh, I have relatives here, so I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> but it's all love. So I said, I'll talk. Oh, I'm going to speak tonight. This is the one, the energy thief. They call you, and the moment you get that call, you know. You, this call, is you're going to end up depressed. <laughs> they call you, krr, krr. so now you're answering. Hello? And then there's silence. <laughs> hello? Yeah, hello. I... So, now you are there thinking, okay, who died? <laughs> who? And they always, the times they call you, it's perfect. They always call you like, just, man, just before you're about to sleep. Or just after you woke up. Like, quarter past six. Who calls a relative quarter past six? Why would you want to call me quarter past six in the morning? Why? Why? I just woke up. Why? Why quarter past six? What is wrong? I, 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 I lost my. <laughs> so I've learned when they say, I just leave it, leave it. Because <laughs> when they say just leave it, they want you to say, ah, ah, no, 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 what's going on? So that they can now start with their lamentations. I do not give them time to lament. What is wrong? I leave it. Oh, okay. Then they go, ow. Are you not going to ask? No, I'm not going to ask because you said I must leave it. But are you really like, I'm going to leave it? So what is wrong? Ah. Mara, I know you won't help me. It's okay. <laughs> Bye. Click. Energy thieves. You have friends who are exactly the same. You have friends who treat you like you are their personal counselor. Every day. They're always the one with marital problems or husband problems, or boyfriend problems. They always have a problem, and you need to be the, you are the chosen pr problem solver. Yeah. No, I'm calling, what is wrong? Uh, one thing I hate, don't you hate it when, you, when somebody calls you all the time for advice, you give them advice, they don't use the advice, and they come back to you again. <laughs> you know, things like, I just want to buy a gun. Why would you, yeah, this guy, what did the guy do to you? No, he beat me up. So what are you going to do? Ah, so what, I'm going to leave him. Okay, leave him. Yeah, I was, I'm done. I'm done. I'm so proud of you. Are you done? I, boom. Lean her track. Done. One week later, they are there in Marwa Mall, walking hand in hand, and you look like an idiot. Chances are they are even gossiping about you. Yeah, he was saying I must leave you. That was, yeah. So now, the boyfriend is working, look, giving you the side eye because she gave him the, the lowdown of what you said. Now you're like, <laughs> so, now when you see them, you're trying to act like you're happy for them. <laughs> Isn't that the most awkward? Huh? Energy thieves. Energy. Once again, I don't want to break up relationships here. I don't want to break up families. Assets and liabilities. I have cousins, double cousins, because we are our almost, so we have whole village. Even those who grew up with my mother, also are my cousins. Assets and liabilities. I block. Me, I'll block. I'll, I'll block you. <laughs> Last time I can't get through, I blocked you. <laughs> so they'll call from another. I block that number two. <laughs> Life is too short. To associate yourself with negative energy. So you wake up in the morning every day looking forward to your day. You cannot outsource your happiness to the next person even if they are your family. You can't outsource that. And there needs to come a time where you need to tell somebody, bruh, let's talk. This nonsense is happening here. Today is the last day. You're not going to, hey, I'm not your punch back, man. You cannot do this to me. And stop asking me for money all the time. I don't have money. We are all trying to get out of this economy. If you do that, then you'll be able to think clearly. So you need to do a couple of things on yourself. 
one of the big, the people who succeed in life, whether it's an athlete, whether it's a businessman, what they have done is you realize they have one common trait. They have built their, themselves personally. They are very mindful about who they are. They know who, what their strengths and their weaknesses are. Do you know what your strengths and your weaknesses are? It's very, very important. There's one person you cannot lie to is yourself, right? You can't tell yourself, okay, next week I'm going to do this. You know you're not going to do that. Why would you want to lie to somebody? Some people lie to so many people, they even start believing their own lies, they start lying to themselves. There's one person you need to be honest, is yourself. And if you don't know something, like if you don't know how the economy works, go to, as, did I see Erwin here? Chipuka. Where's Erwin? Go to people like that. Say to Erwin, Erwin, I don't know, how does this thing work, man? People, and there's another thing that irritates me. Lazarus, I want you to mentor me. I'm not going to mentor you. What mentor in what? No, I just want you to help me with, you know, how to, how to do business what? You don't even know what, bus what business you want. I know I'm just checking a couple of options. <laughs> you don't even know what you want, why you want to be mentored. Mentored what? You know how the mentorship sessions end? Why don't you just invest? Yeah, actually they want money, but they don't know how to ask. So it becomes a mentorship session. So... They were like, okay, this is the idea. Oh, it's a business idea. Oh, okay, but why don't you be my first investor? It's a lie. So this is what I've learned about mentorship. In order to get, you must give. So if you want to see some, Mr. Chipuka, he's a very busy man. He's running a big bank. So what do you say? Mr. Chipuka, I'll buy your lunch. Do you have an hour for me? I'll, I'll buy your lunch. What is your favorite restaurant? It's Stellenbosch. What's in the, go to Stellenbosch. Check. What is the most expensive meal on the menu? Go sell bottles, shoes, whatever. Save that money. Tell Mr. Chipuka, Mr. Chipuka, are you ready for me Monday? Yes. Pay him lunch. You won't say no, will you? Because you are giving something. And he can see you are serious. When you go there, have a plan. So once you have, once you started doing personal development, you will start realizing what's important and what's not. Right? So the second thing I want to talk to you about uh, I, I had to do the show here at the National Theatre of Namibia. The first time I, I performed at the National Theatre of Namibia was 1987. I was in high school. Half of you were probably not even born. <laughs> I was in high school, and this theatre was a theatre for whites only. Occasionally, they used to allow black people to come and perform here, so there was a school theatre competition here. Uh, and where there was a competition here, there was, uh, we came, we, there was a we won, etc. But they only confined us to the stage, uh, to, the, to, the, to the auditorium and the stage. We were not even allowed to use the toilets. It, it happened. My daughter is like, really? Yeah, true. Your daddy has come a long way. Yeah, it's like whites only. <laughs> so when, when, when I did theater in school, I realized it was because of what my parents used to tell me. Because I always ask myself, how do you wake up one day and realize you've got a beautiful voice? How do you discover you have a beautiful voice? Do you just wake up one day and say, hallelujah? And you're like, who? Well, was that me? <laughs> <You know? laughs> right? How, how do you wake up one day and you realize that you, 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 can, you can play soccer? How do you wake up one day and you realize that you, you love theater, you like stage? From a very, very young age, from a very, very young age, you start experimenting with those things that you take an interest in. Isn't it? Me... I'm, I'm the eighth of nine children. I'm the second youngest. My, my younger brother is 45. Now, yeah, I'm that old. <laughs> somebody said to me the other day, the thought of you being older with somebody is just beyond me. Yes, I am older than somebody. So of all my siblings, physically, I'm the, I'm the smallest. I used to be bullied all the time. My siblings like, every time something happens, so I learned to defend myself with my mouth. My, my, my aunt always used to tell me, that mouth of yours is going to get you into trouble one day. So from a very, very young age, so even in class, I was like, I was one of those over-eager kids. <laughs> those annoying ones. Well, before the teacher even finishes the question, you're like, nee! I was one of those who wanted to talk all the time. And one day, one teacher of mine told me, last night I realized you like to talk. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm so sorry. And she said, no, no, that's a good thing. We're going to start a drama club. Says you like to talk, you like to perform, we're going to put you in drama. I'm like, yes! 
So to me, drama, I thought Cosby show. <laughs> you know, I thought, I'd be like Eddie Murphy, Bill Cosby. So I realized that, yes, I can do that. So I started uh, doing drama. I started doing uh, debating. Uh, we, we had these debating clubs in, in school. And I used to win all the time because I had a big mouth. Yet I don't think that I had, I had necessarily the depth. I think it's just because of my big mouth. I used to talk more than the other kids. They were like, yeah, 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 just give me a prize so you can shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so when I, I performed here, I had a, uh, w- when, I won, when I finished school, I started working for the Department of Water Affairs. It was boring. I formed a, a theater club when I used to do the, the leaf application. For, so I was so good. Every day, when I was sitting at work, I was writing a play. So I started making work interesting for myself. I'm like, I used to look forward to going to work. This is the only place because Damara location not conducive to write a play. <laughs> but <laughs> Department of Water Affairs, you have a desk. You have to, oh, they were so nice. Back then, we had telephones there. Yeah? Back then, no telephones, but in the office, I thought, ah, Mr. Jacobs, hello. That was really cool. I used to write that, and I started doing theater in the evenings. And I did a drama club, and we won. We won a prize. I won a prize. I did another show, and I won a, uh, another, I did another play. I wrote a play about Trevor. Yeah, Trevor. I wrote a play about uh, uh, Martin Luther King. And then the Namibian newspaper, uh, one of the, Graham Hopwood, one of the uh, journalists for Namibian newspaper, saw one of my plays, and he came to me and said, Lars, I like the comedy in your show. Why don't you write a satirical com- uh, column for us for the Namibian newspaper? I didn't even know what satirical means. I was like, satirical? What is that? I was like, ooh, there's some serious white stuff, you know? <laughs> but they, they're asking me to do white stuff, and I'm like, cool, I'll do it. I'll do the set, set, that thing. I'll do the set, set thing, yeah. Went home, checked it, could we, we didn't have Google then. I went home, checked the dictionary, what satire I mean. I'm like, but this I've been doing all along. I'm using political satire and stuff. I started writing a column called Exekume for the Namibian newspaper. Do you remember? If you remember that, I know how old you are. So I started writing a, a, a column for the Namibian newspaper. The Namibian gave me that break. I left my job. NBC realized that I'm writing this thing. They approached me. They said, Lazarus, we are looking for people who can write uh, drama for television. We can see you can write. Why don't you write something for us? And I said, sure. So I went to join the NBC drama department. When I started doing NBC drama department, so now that we were together at the NBC then. So now that I was in the news, I was in the education department, and then we started this current affairs program called Talk of the Nation. Yeah? I was the first president of Talk of the Nation. Yep. Got fired. <laughs> got fired. Yeah? Yeah, do you know why I got fired? So, 1993, our government, we had the highest, the biggest drought in the country. They're not like now, back then. Our government, in their collective wisdom, decided to buy a private jet for the president. So, <laughs> so that day, on Talk of the Nation, I was asked to go and present. Back then, there was a minister called Hampi Plifta. He died now. May God bless his soul. So I interviewed Hampi Plifta. Now, you remember my mouth? <laughs> Me and my big mouth. I said, are they seriously going to ask this guy to come to the program? I was so excited. The show was, al- <laughs> the show was always 8.30 on a Tuesday. I was so excited. Man, I went to work 6 o'clock that afternoon. I'm like, I can't wait. And it was also white on top of it. I can't wait for this guy. <laughs> All that apartheid frustration I had. Right? Tonight is tonight. <laughs> I'm just kidding about it. <laughs> so Ambi Plita came. I interviewed him. In Ber- I, I, I cornered him so much, the guy even started speaking Afrikaans on the show. I said, I said, but minister, you cannot buy jet. People are animal dying. People are starving. What, what, what? And Ambi actually said, Machtig Lazarus, man. You know. <laughs> Next day, now whom Golly called me, he was the DJ of NBC, he called me, Lazarus, you know about last night? Mm. Good show, by the way. Good show, great show. But I have, a better, I have a better career option for you. You know, television is so limited. Why don't you go and work on radio? I'm like, huh? Yeah, radio, and you get to meet a lot of young people. It's like, you're firing me, aren't you? 
It's like, yeah, you know, you're doing a great job, but hey, you embarrassed the, the minister, and the minister called me, and who was called by the president, who was called by the secretary general of the United Nations, you gotta go. So I went to do radio. I did a nice uh, radio program called Say It Loud for Young People, blah, blah, blah. While I was on radio, Minister Mbumba was the minister of finance, because I did a program on finance, on my radio program, budgeting for, for young kids. Uh, it was a program about how to teach young people what the, how the national budget works. I interviewed Minister Mbumba. Two days later, he offered me a job as his personal assistant. I was personal assistant. Oh, oh, there was a, oh that's a nice job. Personal assistant. Ah, you are there. Oh, you are there with the minister. They even treat you like a minister. The only thing is, <laughs> the only thing is, you don't have the car, <laughs> the driver. <laughs> hey, personal assistant. You are even sitting next to. Hey, nobody. You have MDs of banks calling you. Ah, hello, Lazarus, can we please have an appointment with uh, Minister Mbumba? No. <laughs> no, the minister is busy. <laughs> or they'll come to you and say, why do you want to brief the minister? Why do you want to see the minister? Can I come and see you? Yes, come. Imagine an MD of F&B, Mr. Chibuka, coming to you, <laughs> briefing you, and you're sitting there looking all important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Guy is talking about income statements, balance sheets, GDP, what, what, that, debt to whatever ratio. You have no idea what <laughs> guy is talking about, but you're just there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <sighs> Mr. Van Vick, this is what he's going to do. I'm going to talk to the minister. I'll see how available he is, whatever. Why don't you call me tomorrow afternoon? <laughs> That's power. <laughs> so. Where I worked for Minister Mumba for about three years, and then they started Namwater, and then I was seconded to go and work at Namwater. When I was at Namwater, I got, in, I got exposed to the corporate environment. While I was in about five years after I started Namwater, um, I bought shares in a company, and then we started a company, and 15 years later, I'm self employed because it started with this mouth. This mouth of mine, right? Many of us are shy about our gifts and talents because we think somehow it's only certain prestigious gifts and talents that you need to flaunt. For those of you who are parents, if you have a child that talks too much, do not discourage the child. Point them in the right direction. You are listening to me today because I have a big mouth and I knew how to use my mouth, right? All because somebody actually said to me, no, no, Lazarus, I want you to join the school theater group. And that's how, to me, being at the National Theater of Namibia, I think I have come full circle. And I thank you. So, can I have some water? Thank you. This is my daughter. She's one of my two children. She's one of two children that I know of. <laughs> I know, you know, black, you don't ask black people how many kids we have. <laughs> we always find out at the funeral. <laughs> when we die, they ask, can all the kids please stand up? <laughs> <laughs> then the real kids that we know stand up. <laughs> they all stand up. And then after five minutes, you see all these miscellaneous kids standing up. <laughs> Like, who, what? Who, Maria? No, no. But when you look at them, <laughs> so every time you see black women crying at funerals, throwing themselves on the coffin, <laughs> it's not because they are really sad because their husband died. <laughs> they are sad because of what he left behind. <laughs> okay, I'm oh, sorry, I got distracted for a minute. So, so now, 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 every year, I, I get an opportunity to go home. Uh, I, I try to go home. My, my mom is still in the north, but I have tried to go home. So, recently I visited my hometown. And when I was in school, um, I was probably one of those average, I mean, I was average, guys. I was useless. In school, academically, ah, no, me, I was bad. <laughs> you, if I had the choice, I wouldn't go to school. Ah, no, me, I was like, if you could pass with an F, I'll get an F. If it took a D to pass, I'll get a D. I mean, like, what? I'm just trying to get to the next grade. Why am I trying? You know, I hated these overachievers. Yeah, get an A, 
Now they are depressed. You need to take away the tablets. They're going to commit suicide because they didn't get A+. What, what, what are you trying to do? What? <laughs> you know? So in school, I, I, I was with this guy, Robert. We were together. I get confused with his grade in standard. So let me talk about standard. From standard four to standard seven, Robert and I were in the same class. Robert was a mathematics genius, man. Robert, and there's a, uh, he's, he's, he's Herrero, and uh, there's a reason why I'm saying what his type was. Robert, no, there's a good reason, you know. He's a good reason. To, I, you know these millennials, every time you say Herrero, like, oop. <laughs> then the job of Mupanda Raider goes over. <laughs> hey, are they, they want to repossess something. <laughs> so, Robert was a math genius. Robert was brilliant. Robert and I kid you not, Robert was so good, he used to correct the question paper of the teacher. That's how good he was. When we used to do X plus what, what? Do you, what was it? Okay, why were we doing X times X is X? Why? What am I using it for right now? Right now, here. Yeah. I have a business. I employ 150 people. I don't know why X plus X is X equals what. Why, why were we doing that? Erwin, why are we doing X plus X? <laughs> and why were we studying lizards and grasshoppers? Why? Huh? Why? Malcolm, we used, to, we used to study grasshoppers. The eyes of grasshoppers. Question paper comes, the eyes are so big. How many? No, he's got two big eyes and 50 little eyes inside the eye. And this is the digestive system of a, of a cockroach. Come on. That was racist. They assume, they assume black people live with cockroaches, so they better study these damn things. Why were you studying cockroaches? So oh, they, they, they can smell with their tentacles and cockroaches. Do you, did you know, fun fact, did you know a cockroach can survive a nuclear attack? Who cares? I, can it, hey. Can a cockroach survive my feet? I go like, <laughs> survive that for a minute. What are you trying to? Why? why? Cockroaches and, and grasshoppers. And... Anyway, so I realized every time that the education that we have was distracting us. And Robert was a genius. Robert was so good at mathematics. Robert was assigned to me. Me, I was a dunderhead. I could not, and me, I was like, I will not use this stuff. I know. Robert had to teach me. It's the X factor or what was the stuff called? Uh, yeah, but I had bundle education. Algebra X, X factura. X hot. Sorry. Anyway, so Robert was assigned to me. Robert was so good. Uh, when we went to high school, I went to high school in Swakopmund. Robert went, went to Okakarara, <clears throat> to a technical, a technical college, because his father thought he needs to learn a trade, he can use his hands and stuff like that. About two years ago, I got a call from an old school friend of mine. Uh, he was a classmate. He said, hey, last visit. He's one of those friends. You, you also have those friends, eh? They, they always know what's happening where. Yeah, they always try also to get... get I started school in 1977, guys. There's a guy who will tell you, on Doji, when we're, 90, when we're in Sub A, there was this other girl, man, which was that other one, man. She used to wear this yellow dress. 1977, 2018, he's telling me this stuff. So now this guy called me and he said, man, Lars, are you going to Robert's funeral? And I was like, no, man, Robert, who? I can't give the name because we are recording this. Um, no, no, seriously, to respect the family. So, and I was like, what happened? No, Robert died. Where? No, they discovered his body after seven days. His body was decomposed. I was like, what? I was like, no, man, people like Robert don't die. No, Robert, people like Robert are, are geniuses, man. They don't die. So I said, okay, I'm going to bury Robert. I went to Robert. I came to the funeral. Now, as it happens at every funeral, you try to identify the people you know, the people you grew up with. Out of our class, let's say we were 40. Out of the class, there were only seven of us. I asked, what happened to this guy? Ah, guy's gone. Where? Ah, 
Last time we saw he was, I don't know, he was an alcoholic or something. What happened to this woman? Ah, she died. What? Ah, she had AIDS. What happened to her? Ooh, I don't know. That one was killed by her husband. What happened to that? And I realized out of 40 of us, there was only seven that are surviving. How did Robert die? Robert died on a farm. Robert was a farm worker. And he had a fight with somebody who stabbed him, and they only discovered his body seven days later. I was like, how? How did this mathematic genius die a farm worker? How did that happen? I went to speak to one of, uh, to Jackson, which is Robert's uh, uh, brother. They were so-called half brothers. I said, what happened? Robert went to school in Okakarara. His father told him, you need to leave school because we have cattle to look after. And I'm about, I'm sick. So Robert left uh, the farm, I mean, they left school, started looking after his father's farm. Father's farm, cattle were stolen. Robert did not have a qualification. He ended up working on somebody's farm, and that's how he ended up being a farm worker. Uh, and I said, because there's a, certain, there's a certain element of guilt for me when I know there was somebody who was smarter than me, and I'm here burying them, and materially, I'm, I was better off than them. And I was like, how does that happen? Any given day, we are given a chance to make a decision. And one decision you, de you make in one moment can change your life forever. Robert's father told him to make that decision, to leave school and go and look after the father's cattle. That moment, Robert's life changed forever. My teacher told me, Lazarus, we're going to have to use your mouth to start the drama club. And beca because of that, I am blessed to have a family, to have an income, to be okay. Just because at that moment, we took a chance. Now, when you look at our economy, you need to ask yourself, what is this economy telling me? What chance can I take? I, I, every given day when you wake up, if you wake up tomorrow, if God blesses you, you wake up tomorrow in life, you need to ask yourself, what is this day trying to tell me? What decisions am I going to take today that are going to change the course of my life? The decision you are taking now, whether you're going to stay with a guy who's abusive to you, the guy who's killing you, the guy who's, who's, who's swearing at you and do all kinds of things, whether you're staying in a job you are not happy with, every day you're like, oh, I'm, I'm getting stomach ulcers because my boss is just insulting me and doing all kinds of things to me, or that business idea that you have, but you are afraid because you don't have money to start that business. Every day that passes with you not making the decision. Remember, if you do not make a decision, you are making a decision. Every day. So you need to ask yourself, what is this economy telling me? So let me just tell you something. If you have a business plan, then don't be a brother project. If you have a business plan, if you have an idea for a business, first thing you need to el eliminate out of your mind, if you want to do something, if you want to get out of an abusive relationship, if you want to start a business, if you want to start a new career, if you want to leave town, if you want to leave the country, one thing that is very common amongst us, we ask ourselves the question, and this is where the fear comes in, what will the people say? I remember when we started our business, I went to a couple of people, and a very, very good relative of mine, I said, I'm going to start a business. She, he, uh, he, she said to me, <laughs> why do you want to start a business? What do you know about business? You didn't even go to school for business. And I was like, I'm going to do this thing. Right? Don't go to people, if you want to make a decision, don't go to people for validation of your decision. Go to people for support of your decision. If they don't support you and you feel in your soul you need to do the thing, remember, all of us here, and it sounds a little bit depressing, all of us here have something we want to accomplish. But we are scared. You know why you are scared? We are scared for one reason. Not if it doesn't work, what if it works? 
right? Let's say, my brother, you want to go to America because you look like an actor, right? <laughs> Let's say you want to go to Hollywood and you see yourself starring in Black Panther 2. <laughs> now you are the brother of the king of Wakanda, right? Now you're saying to yourself, something is telling you I can make it when I go to Hollywood. But you're scared. What are you scared of? Is that your woman? <laughs> Ooh, wrong question. <laughs> Let's assume. Let's assume you are married. Huh? Let's assume you are married. For the sake of this. Yeah? D don't film them. Now, you, now you're scared. You're like, I've got a family. I've got a wife. I've got a mother. I've got a father. If I leave them behind, what will happen to me? Tell you what. By you staying here, you are putting them at a disservice because you need to go and be who you ought to be so that you can be the best you can be so that you can pre present your best self to them. Right now, we are speaking hypothetically. Right now, you are just giving them 50% because the fear that you have is preventing you from achieving your 100% so that you can give yourself to them 100%, isn't it? Fear. If this economy is telling you, sometimes if you wanted to leave your job, and I'm an employer and I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it. If you wanted to leave your job and you knew you wanted to do something and the boss says, I'm going to retrench people, say, me! You need to take that leap of faith. They always say, every crisis creates an opportunity. So I'm going to ask yourself, I'm going to ask you the question. This crisis that we have right now, what opportunity is it presenting you? And I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So... Thank you so much. Uh, somebody was asking me, it was a last minute thing. Here, this is where I, I was supposed to have the Hollywood moment, where I say thank you, and dramatic music comes on. <laughs> and I exit stage, you know? And you guys, like, women run after me for autographs. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody said, ask, please, please, if people have questions to ask, can they ask me? But if you don't have questions, we can do the Hollywood thing. So I'm going to take a few questions, if anybody has a question. We don't need a mic, huh? Cause Who's got a question? Yes, sir. Do you mind coming forward? Come forward, my brother. You hate, you hate black people? Oh. <laughs> okay, hi, Michael. Okay, uh, just one question. <laughs> See the nice Porsche, uh, the Lamborghinis, I don't know if you have any. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Either way. Now, for us as young people, we always look up to guys like you. But you guys always tell us the half story of the true success. We always come to you like, Lars, how did you make it? Then you would be like, ah, my chief, just work hard. Uh, work hard. Work hard. But trust me, our parents have been working hard. They're still in the ghetto. Our friends are working hard. They're still paying off the city golf they bought from the bank. So, what's the true secret? Because we all know that there is a secret to this thing called success. Mm. But in your own words, how would you sum it up to say one or two things that have totally propelled you to where you are today? Yeah. Because we can all say work hard, work this, but there is one or two things that you would most probably be able to share with everyone 
and we'd all be able to take one or two things away home that we can also go change in our own personal lives because we touched on a number of things, fear, all of those other things, but what other attributes can you add on so that we can properly take home a nice cooked meal that we can also enjoy awesome. in the morning? Awesome. That's a good question, Mike. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> okay, first things first. All of us here, seven billion of us on this planet, we all have a unique journey, right? There's no, there's no wholesale recipe. Each one of us, I always say, God doesn't create people because it's his hobby. We are all created with, created with a purpose. Now, let me be a little bit philosophical to answer your question. Now, if the people who make it in life, the people that we see, we perceive to have been successful, there are certain, uh, in my personal opinion, there are certain characteristics that you see. First of all, are either people who have identified their purpose very, very early on in life and they go for it. Or, in my, in my case, I, I, don't, I only have grade 12. I never went to university. I was presented opportunities and I grabbed those opportunities. Right? I, I saw an opportunity. I could have turned around when I was told uh, the minister told me, Lazarus, I want you to be my personal assistant. I would have said, no, but I don't have an economics degree. I don't have a great, I don't have a diploma. Why do you want to do this? Michael, the problem, the thing is, all the hard work, uh, my father always used to tell me this, and I'll always, I'll always remember this. He said, it's not what you do, it's what you get done. So my father always used to tell us, like we see people uh, carrying, uh, they're pushing sand in a wheelbarrow. And they're, every day they're just it, pushing sand in a wheelbarrow. You need to ask yourself, what am I going to use this sand for? I'm moving it from here to there every day, but what am I using that sand for? So you need to be able to say, I'm working hard for a particular purpose, isn't it? So we can, be, we can all work hard, but okay, let me, let me get a little bit personal. Uh, I don't perceive myself to have made it. Because, bruh, if I tell you my dreams, hey, <laughs> you see, I just, I just think what I'm doing right now, where I am in life right now, is part of my journey to get to where I want to be. The biggest challenge we always face in, in this environment is people always equate success with material success, right? I have relatives, they, don't, they are not even faced by a Porsche or a Ferrari. To him, if he can be a good father, he has made it. There's nothing, I know, I, I know for example, I, I'll be personal about it. I know Neville. There's not, nothing that gives Neville as much joy as being with his kids and his family. He loves his family. And I learned so much from him. Neville will talk about his family the way other people will talk about their Porsches and Ferrari. Because you need to determine what is, what do you consider your level of success. At the end of the day, and Michael, by the way, I've sold the Porsche. By the way, <laughs> uh, and, and the thing is, I realized that um, I was losing focus on what I was supposed to do because I was placing too much emphasis on material success, right? Bigger car, bigger house, bigger houses, a farm, two farms, bigger farms. It becomes an endless pit. Right? Endless pet. You need to say, it's almost like a drug. You need, you need to keep using that cocaine. You need to use it because the high is not high enough. You need to make it higher and stuff like that. You cannot really reach success unless you have reached internal peace. You need to say, this is my peace. Yeah? So, what I, will do, what I will do to take home is this. I'll be like what I said right in the beginning when I started. My brother, work on yourself. First, first and foremost. Work on your first, uh, self. First, secondly, and people always avoid to do this. Michael, I'll tell you with a straight face, without lying. If it was not for God, I wouldn't have been here. You know, I, we're going to go to church. You know, because I, I realize that my well-being also meet, is complemented by my spiritual well-being. You know, so the other day when I told my friend I'm, I sold my Porsche, he was like, oh, Lars, how could you? But what are the people going to say? Ooh, they're going to say, you're broke. <laughs> oh, hey, they're getting money. They're money. They're going to 
I realized that the same satisfaction I get driving in the bucky of my, my farm bucky. In fact, the Porsche was also so uncomfortable. You know, it's like... <laughs> you are sitting uncomfortable, so every time you see a guy in a Porsche sitting like this, he's not posing, he's actually... You, you follow? So, so, but if, if, if your ultimate form of success is material success, I will not blame you for it. I will not, I will not criticize you for it. You need to determine your own destiny. I can just tell you, for me, that's not material success. To me, my destiny, my success is to say, you have my daughter coming to see me. There are people who do not have a relationship with their daughters. Right? There are people who are going through a divorce right now. To me, I'm blessed to be able to have a show and come and share these things with people. That, tonight I can say, God, tomorrow it's okay, I can go. Because I can die knowing that I did what I love doing. Does it answer your question, Mike? Okay, thanks. Next question. Yes. Yes. It would be like a swap meeting. Identify yourself first. Which branch are you? <laughs> Hi, I'm Neke. I'm the Sheta branch. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Okay, um, Mike, I know you spoke about inner peace, and I know you spoke about um, defining what you want to achieve. But uh, as young adults, one of the challenges besides uh, overcoming fear is making the decision. You spoke about rock. And I could understand Rob's situation was probably out of uh, obedience and wasn't a decision that he made himself. So how do I, as a young adult, make a decision when I'm now working, say for instance, I want to quit my job and go study, but I'm the first born with six siblings that I'm looking after, and aging parents that I now have to pay back in a way and look after them too, because I'm the elder child who's a girl, and, and, and. How do I say as much as I love my Your family, parents, yeah. How do I walk away and say this is what I want to achieve? Because as much as it's easier to say go for what you dream about and have inner peace, you also have a responsibility and you have to overcome the guilt of making that decision. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. You see, I, I'm so happy you said it so that I can clarify. You see, the example I gave of Robert, I wasn't, I wasn't blaming his parents or his father. For example, my oldest sister, our firstborn, also, when she finished school, she had to start working so that she can start su supporting the family. I demonstrated that sometimes decisions are take, taken that changes the course of our lives, either for good or for bad. So that's why I was trying to juxtapose the, the two. But as for you, uh, for, for your example, and it's the same with me, and it's, it's the same for a lot of black families, we have this thing called black tax, right? And it's a reality we grew up with. I have that reality. Uh, if, if I need to look at, I need to give my mother something, it's not even, I, it's not even something I consider. It's something I have to do. If your mom is sick, you, you, you know, we, me and my siblings, we get together and say, well, mom needs so much money, we need to do this, or the house needs to be fixed, we need to do, get together and do that. What you need to do is, you need to identify that as part of your journey. The reason why you are the firstborn, looking after your siblings and looking after your parents, that's part of your journey, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. Because there's so many lessons that can come out of that. I can hear from what you're saying and all of this stuff. That will teach you, you will have a better sense of responsibility than a guy who's growing up alone who doesn't have to look after anybody. So the decisions that you are making now, because I'm sure you're getting a salary, and you say, okay, part of this needs to go to my family. Part of this needs to go to, to myself and to my studies, to my house and stuff like that. By the time you have moved on from that, can you imagine the amazing decisions you're going to make in your life because the foundation has been laid? So you shouldn't necessarily see it as a, as a, as a negative thing. I was, I was talking to people uh, in the company the other time. And I said to them, wherever you find yourself, let's say you find yourself working for MTC right now. Where are the MTC people? MTC. Wherever you find yourself working at MTC right now, it is part of your journey, you know that. Things, there are no coincidences. This is like, oh, by the way, I don't know what, there's a reason why you're working here. And let me just tell you something. Sometimes you get the job, and the only reason why God put you at the particular place is for you to meet your future husband. 
You understand? Or, or you were put on that journey at MTC to meet somebody who's going to tell you there is another job at Namewater and you're going to become an MD at Namewater one day. You know, that's why life, you need to be very careful of the moments every day. To be human, you need to be conscious. That's why I say you, we need to do personal work. You need to be conscious about every decision you're you taking every day. Now, the question I'll, I'm going to ask you is this. Everywhere you go, when you're working, you come in touch with people, with friends, family, and things like that, you are leaving your DNA, there's fingerprints everywhere you're going. And I ask you this question. I want you to close your eyes. Imagine you are at a funeral. It's your funeral. What will your colleagues say about you? <laughs> That's the question you need to ask yourself. You can do the same thing with your family. You can say you are at a family at a funeral. It's your funeral. What do your family say about you? That's what's going to because you're going to say, oh, I don't think these people are going to have a favorable. It's nobody, if, if people, you know, I, I, you attend a sad funeral. Huh? Sometimes you go to a funeral and they say, is there anybody who wants to say something? <laughs> and nobody's like, ah, ooh, ah, no. me, I don't have. <laughs> ah, let, me, let me just keep quiet because me, I don't have nice, nice things to say. I don't think people need to say nice things about you all the time. But the question is, how, were you, how did you impact people wherever you are? Whether it's your future husband, Hollywood, right? Or a colleague or a wife. If you are no longer there, when you move, what will they say about you? That's what keeps me going all the time. Because the only reason, I believe the only reason why we are here is we are here to serve each other, to be of service to each other. But if you are here and you are just not of service to people, why are you here? We're not, we're not, exactly. Are we going to remember, I don't want to be remembered as the guy who had a Porsche. Yeah? I see in even Ghana people get buried with their cars. Yeah? Whole car. A whole, yes. A whole car, in the coffee, like the dead body is there. It, I want to be, it's actually in the will, I want to be buried in my car. How empty do you have to be inside to be buried in a car? <laughs> so like one day, one day maybe by some miracle they're going to come up with something to bring you back and you can just drive out of your grave. Or... <laughs> Last question? No, family is not allowed to ask questions. Oh. Okay, darling, what's, what's the question? Hi, love. Um, okay, thank you. Hi. Uh, so one question that I have um, that I'm happy to ask so that I have witnesses because <laughs> otherwise my lectures go on forever. Um, but something that I think that my generation struggles with is that because we have access to social media, we're constantly bombarded with how successful other people are and we feel the need to strive for the same success. So one thing that happens to me is that I get very lazy because I'm very tired because I feel like I can't reach the level of success that 21-year-olds are having right now. I mean, my friends are getting married and have kids, and I'm trying to graduate, and it's really hard. Um, so I wanted to know what your advice is for a new generation, because you utilize your social media, and how when you, I mean, you came from apartheid, like how you got yourself out of that and said, I'm going to do this, and what the drive was to do this. Okay. Okay, there were actually two questions. First one, first of all, the first thing you need to understand, social media is a lie. Social media is just, it's just one big cesspool of lies. You know, I, look, have you seen how people post for social media? Right? I'm waiting... I'm waiting to follow somebody on Instagram who's telling me they just got a letter from the bank that they're going to repossess his house. <laughs> okay. Or I'm waiting to see a, a, a post of somebody in Okoriangava chilling in a little shack saying Sunday sessions. 
Right. So, social media for the for it's very 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 dangerous. I think whoever started some of these social media platforms, whether like Mark Zuckerberg says it all the time, the reason why he started Facebook is so that the world can connect each other. So, so we took that ball and ran with connect. We're like, let me connect with you and tell you how miserable your life is. Right? How miserable your life is. Like, ooh, a hashtag. It's always a hashtag, whatever. Sunday things, uh, hope, mention things, and stuff like that. It's so bad. Some people go to other people's houses, post for pictures there, post the pictures when their pictures like chilling at home. <laughs> so the, the social media, social media, they have actually done a study in the United States the other day, and they realized that 60, no, I'm lying, 45% of teenage suicides is because of social media. Because either they are being bullied on social media, or they feel, like you say, pressurized by social media. Like, how come... They are wearing Air Force Ones, and I'm wearing butter. Do they still make butter? Butter techies? <laughs> you follow what I mean? So, here's the thing, and I try to remember that all the time. Remember, the, the, the pressure that you have is a pressure that I have. It's the same pressure that Michael has. It's the same pressure that you have. I have a business partner. He drives a Bentley. So when I roll up there with my G-Wagon, they look at me like I'm driving a Corolla. <laughs> They're like, so now what's wrong with this one? <laughs> Your part, so oh, they were like, oh, so last, when is yours coming? <laughs> my what? Your Bentley. Why? Oh, this has got a Bentley. I'm like, that's his Bentley. You follow? If you do internal personal work, if you know who you are, you do not have to follow anybody. You don't have to. And we are blessed differently. Some people are blessed with money. Some people are blessed with mathematics. Some people are blessed with good looks like myself. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? So, we are blessed differently. The minute I read something, this and I'm going to sound cheesy, but I'm going to repeat it to you. The more, every time you are jealous of somebody else's blessing, you are overlooking your own blessing. So you need to say, God, you brought me here. Show me what you can do. Oh, put God on the test. He's going to embarrass you. You're like, what do you want? I want to play for the brave warriors. Okay, this is what we're going to do. You just have to obey. So the, po the, the thing I'm trying to tell you is this. Don't overlook your blessings. That's the thing. Secondly, you asked me about how I, I survive apartheid. It's because of apartheid that I had that drive. You see... A lot of people don't understand, you, apart at the different levels, it was, you can't go in that shop, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't go to that school. But one thing that they have done successfully is to make you feel inferior. The, the whole system make you feel like you are worth nothing. Like, they designed, apartheid was designed to survive in perpetuity. For generations and generations. I don't want to get into this because this is a long political discussion. But because of that, because it's mental, it becomes a serious challenge. Sometimes when you are in confrontation with a white guy, and it happens with me all the time, I can't help but see him as a white person. I can't just see him as a guy who's trying to find... You understand? Because, look... If a white guy tells me nonsense, man, even if he's right, I'm like, no, ah, no. <laughs> not today, you choose, ah, you are wrong, ah, but not today. So, ah, these white people, you understand what I mean? That's what they have done. You know, because the thing is now from apartheid, you came from a system that said you are inferior. Uh, let me tell you this quickly. Uh, and oof, Let me tell you this quickly. The political system that we have right now, that we had in our country was this. Before independence, we were the political minority but the numerical majority. Right? The white people were the political majority but the numerical minority. After independence, we became the political majority and the numerical majority. But mentally, we are still acting like minor the minority. You follow? And it has a lot of effects, psychological. 
And the reason why we buy big cars and big cars, it's almost like we're trying to prove something. Because you've been told. It's almost like we're trying to compensate. Like, I need to drive this big car to show I'm not in the minority anymore. They have messed us up. So it takes, it takes, let me just tell you something. A white kid grew up in this country before independence. They say if this system went so long, it becomes genetic. A white kid wake up and he knows the system is for them. If the system changes, like, what the hell is happening? And I'll tell you why. A white kid used to, were born in a white neighborhood, went to a white school, white university, white owned job, white wife, white kids, cars from white dealership, houses from a white estate agent. White people did not need black people unless black people were in a supporting role. He goes to school. Hold on. Let's start at home. The only black pe person he knows is the gardener and the cleaning lady. He goes to school, same thing. The gardener, security. Goes to university, same thing. Goes to work, same thing. What does he need black people for? Polish my shoes, do this. So this white kid wakes up and he grows up with that. Every day. The minute a black government comes to power, it's like, okay, white school, all right. Let them come in, but we still have the white school. White university, white, white, white. You understand? Genetically, they cannot process the fact that they need to share this with the black people. Genetically, it's difficult. It was like, no, the, the, what's wrong with the system? Now, it's difficult just to be human. Now you have to be black as well. You follow what I mean? So, we need to be able to understand political minority versus political majority. So, sometimes we even talk about, yeah, but why don't we change our laws? Why don't we change our... Guys, you can't change the law like that. Ask Robert Mugabe. No, I'm serious. Try touching... The, I don't want to get into another, another uh, uh, discussion now, but white people have done some, one thing successful that we need to learn generational wealth, right? White kids know, Ocean, see that plus that? You see that farm? It was your great-grandfather's farm, which he got from his great-great-grandfather, which my grandfather got from his grandfather. And when I die, that's going to be your farm. What are you giving your kid? A Porsche? A Bentley? White people live a will. Our parents live a bill. <laughs> Last question. Oh, sorry, she, and then you. <laughs> sorry, I have the mic before you. Okay, no problem. Um, good evening, Lazarus. I don't know if you'll remember me. I don't know if you can see me. Well, my wife is it here. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Um, I saw you looking at your watch, so I'll try and make this really swift. No um, over time, we've learned now, in this day and age, if you want to get anything done, um, you've got to make some sacrifices. If you want to pass in university, you've got to sacrifice your social life, your weekends. If you want to um, make it at work during your budget, you've got to sacrifice some of your luxuries. What I want to find out from you is, what have you sacrificed in your personal life and in your business life? Um, to make it this far? Uh, personal life, um, two things. In my personal life, I've sacrificed relationships. Relationships that will never recover because I was too busy chasing, 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 chasing. And then I actually isolated people I shouldn't have isolated. I, I've made that sacrifice. Secondly, <clears throat> I sacrificed an education. I always wanted to, to go to university. And I always wanted, there's nothing that will make me happier to, than to win Namibia's first Oscar. I always used to say, I'm going to win Namibia's first Oscar. But Oscar, because I wanted to direct movies. Oscar, sorry. Hollywood. Dun, 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 dun. Oscar. I actually even, I even know the, the acceptance speech. Well, first of all, I just want to say, if it wasn't for Swapo, Oh, 
I won't be here. And I want to give this to the founding president. <laughs> and in, in, in business, in business I'm, doing, I'm making sacrifices all the time. You see, when you are in business, and, and this is my experience, maybe other people have other experience, you are sacrificing something. You are sacrificing a relationship. There's, there's, a, there's a heartbreaking story I can tell. There was, a, there was this guy who used to work for us. We started together. When he started working for us, we started working together. And you know when you work together for seven or eight hours every day, you're together. The people that you work with are the people you're going to spend most of the, your life with. So you might as well treat them well. This guy stole from us. And we had no choice. I know his wife. I know his kids. I've been to his house. I've eaten. We, he had to go to jail. And I, I, I will never forget the look he gave me when they locked him up. And there's a sacrifice I made. Because it happened like three times. The first time was like, I let it slide. The second time is like, the third time he was like, look, man, ah, yeah, call the police then. I did that. Okay, like Jay-Z say, okay. <laughs> I called him. But I, that, that was a relationship I sacrificed. And it's very, very good. And the other sacrifice, um, personally, like when we started our business, I didn't spend a lot of time with my daughter. Because we're just working late hours. And so I try to compensate now. You know? <laughs> she said I can compensate a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. But, but it's true. Every, with great success come great sacrifice. There's very few, I don't know of anybody who has become successful, whether it's an athlete. You can talk to Frank. Frank will tell you. Last, I've, I've sacrificed relationships because I, I had to be disciplined in my training. I had to be disciplined in whatever. You have to sacrifice. But an abusive husband, you can leave. That's a good sacrifice. Next question. Good evening. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Jeanette. Um, okay, personally, I have fallen in this trap where I, how should I say, I, there's a lot of negativity around me. Number one, I'm young. I, I work at MTC. I started working when MTC. I was 21. Yes. When I started working when I was 21. And, you know, it's just these comments of, yeah, you're too young. You're working for a big company. So how do I come out of that life where I'm trying to build something for myself, but there's just all these people that, as much as I laugh it off, sometimes it really just creeps up. It, and then it, it will just, get to you. Yeah, it gets to you that you just feel like, okay, What's wrong? Is there something wrong with me? Or, you know, so how do I live past the negative, just the, the, the negative? And then another thing, um, I have laid so much, like so many goals for myself, but then I doubt myself even before I start. So how do you live past your doubts and just procrastinating despite of my age? And Because I know I'm capable of a lot of things, but then I look down on myself even before I start. So how do I get over that? You know, it's so interesting because I, when, when I had the opportunity to speak to the founding president, uh, but when he's retired, he became more chill, so you could speak a little bit about, to him about his personal life and his personal journey. And I asked him the exact same question. Because remember when he left into exile, he was like 26. He was very young. So I asked him now, how did you do that? He said to me, his mission was very simple. He was sent to go and report Namibia's case to the United Nations. He was sent to New York, but he went through Botswana. Botswana, he ended up in Tanzania. Tanzania, he went to Ghana, came back to Tanzania. Then he ended up in New York. When they started the liberation struggle, he tells us, sorry, darling, can you take this? When they started the, the liberation struggle, they never thought their generation is going to be the liber liberators. They always thought that, okay, we'll be the first group of people who are going to die, and the next generation is going to be liberated. But he said, his mission was to go and, and do that. And I said, so what did you do? He surrounded himself with elders. So, who are you surrounding yourself with? Right? Assets? Secondly, since you are black, 
this thing of what do people say? Have you noticed that people who come and discourage you to do something, from doing something, are nowhere? Nobody who's successful will discourage you from becoming successful. You know? And, and, and they are very slick. And, and I always say to people, remember, the people who are most likely to destroy are those who are close to you. Because they know you. Yeah? They know your strength and your weaknesses. I always say, look, let me just tell you something. Malcolm, if somebody wants to hurt you, right, they're going to come through your wife. Right? Sorry. Are they both? <laughs> Since you are Herero, is what? Chiramwe. It's a good suggestion, eh? So, my, uh, my brother Neville and I, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you, I'll tell you this by demonstration. Of Neville and I, I started comedy, Neville joined me, but we did comedy together. And for a very, very long time, people started, wanted to come to, to between the two of us. Ah, Neville, you know, you are funnier than Lazarus. Ah, Lazarus, why are you even using Neville? You know? So, oh, they'll go to Neville and say, hey, Neville, do you know that Lazarus was talking nonsense about you the other day? Oh, Lazarus, do you know Neville is doing that? So Neville and I have this rule. If somebody tells you something that's going to hurt me, don't tell me. If you know the thing is going to hurt me, why would you want to tell me? But if the thing has got potential danger, you can tell me. If somebody says, say, Lazarus, don't go to the club, the guy is going to shoot you, of course you're going to tell me. But if you're going to come with stupid, rubbish nonsense of, oh, Lazarus, we're here, apparently you guys stole money from Michael Amushilelo, and you told, stand, stole his tender documents. Now I'm sitting here, okay, I was supposed to think about a business proposal. Now I need to think, okay, first of all, what's the first thing we black people do? This is why we're different from white people. You can tell white people something, they just, okay, it's okay. Us, we want to find out. Which one I Come on, scan so far. I, I'm going to wait, call him. Do his number. Call him now. Now you're spending a whole week trying to dispel a rumor. You could have used that week to do whatever you want to do. So, the people who come to you, and I'll tell you, it has worked with me. The people who come to you and tell you those stories about you, you are your small one. They fear you. Because they know, they can see the potential in you. You know, sometimes people see potential in us before we see potential in ourselves. They look at you and they're like, ooh, this girl. So but if she stays a year longer, she's going to take over as a senior. So let me just start talking her down. Don't you want to, why are you even doing here? Are you even old enough to work here? You understand? A person who is confident in themselves will not talk down another person. Why? I don't talk down on people because I know who I am. You know, I'm short, I'm short man. We, who, we, are, hey, we are arrogant. You can't move a short man. You're like, what are you going to, what? <laughs> what? What can you tell me, me, what? You know? So you need, to, you need to understand your journey. Next time they say that to you, say to them, I thank you very much for that, but this is my journey. What is your journey? So I think we're done. We're done, eh? Yeah. Let's do the Hollywood thing. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, boss. What a show. Thank you very much for coming, ladies and gentlemen. So three little things. The hashtag is hashtag chilling with Laz. Okay? So let's take a lot of pictures. Let's post them on all our social media platforms, except Facebook, I'm joking. But yeah, chilling with Laz. We have drinks outside, it's a cash bar, and we have DVDs on sale. I mean, sorry, CDs on sale, it's $100. Thank you very much, have a good night, drive safe, enjoy the rest of your evening.